Good morning and welcome home. It's Sunday at Trinity Baptist Church and we are so excited that you are here. Connection is very important to all of us. If you are new to Trinity, we would love to connect with you at the welcome tent in the courtyard after the service. Please take a moment to fill out the connection card located in the pew racks in front of you or on our website at tbcocala.church. While you're exploring our website, we would love to invite you to sign up for our next Discover Trinity on August 29th. Discover Trinity is a casual time to meet our staff, learn more about Trinity, and find out how you can get connected into the life of our church. For a complete list of our upcoming events and more, check out the What's Happening page on our website. Thank you for joining us today. Now let's worship together. Trinity Baptist Church, let's all stand to our feet. Happy Fourth of July, everybody. Put those hands together. Here to celebrate the Lord and His greatness in this place. Let's sing it together. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way.
let's all turn our attention to the baptistry this morning. Well, good morning, church family. And I have with me Lily Anderson. And um, last week at camp, she gave her life to Christ. Amen. And so this morning we get to celebrate uh, her first step of obedience to come into the baptism waters. And so Lily, have you confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And it's my privilege, my sister, to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Very good Christ and baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. There's nothing that God can't do. Amen. And he's in the drawing and saving business. And that is our prayer this morning. Let's pray as we continue in worship. Father, we are thankful for this day. We're thankful for Lily. We're thankful for your amazing grace. Father, no matter what obstacles are in our way, there is nothing that you cannot do. And you prove to us day in and day out how mighty you are. Father, we love you. And we just leave everything to you. We lay it at your feet. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Praise the Lord as you're being seated today. 
and happy Independence Day to you. Fourth of July, Sunday. We've always celebrated Fourth of July. My family history is full of those patriotic sayings, like don't hold the firecracker in your hand when you light it. Do not aim the Roman candle at your friends, and you'll put your eye out if you light that too close to your face. That's what I grew up with on Independence Day. Hamburgers, hot dogs. But you know, as I've gotten older, just a little on the outside, I'm mindful to remember that although as a country we are free as a person, I still belong to God. See, although I'm independent as a U.S. citizen, I am fully dependent upon God. And I'm okay with that because that's where there's safety. That's where there's security. That's where the real fun happens for me. So today, as we remember to celebrate our country, let us also remember the God that gave us our country. That in this moment, on this day, we come to worship him and him alone. And a little later in our service, we can worship through our giving. Hopefully you were greeted today with all our greeters in their nice blue shirts and many of them having American flags. And, and I just remember growing up and remembering one nation under God. Today, we are under God's blessing, and I encourage you to worship him as you sing today, to worship him in your heart as you hear his words proclaimed today, and also worship as you leave today, as you leave your tithes and offerings, that we may be able to be one city under God, and one state under God, and one nation under God, to do God's will. And with your help, and your faithfulness, and your support, we'll do it. Because if God is forced, who is against us? Especially when we're proclaiming his truth. And so today, celebrate. Be patriotic. Love your country with all the things that we'll hear about soon in Pastor Jason's message as we wrap up this series. But be a part of something bigger than you. Invest in God's kingdom and watch what God does to our wonderful nation. Let's pray and ask God to bless us even more right now. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the celebration. Thank you, Lord, for the red, white, and blue. But Lord, while we're thanking you, I thank you most of all for Jesus Christ who saved me. I thank you for your spirit that resides in me, that, that gives me direction, that gives me comfort, that gives me hope. And Lord, I thank you that one day I'll see you face to face, that we'll spend eternity together. But between now and then, Lord, I pray that I just live for you and I live it out. You've given us so many things in this country. Lord, use us today to be an influence on others for your sake on this Independence Day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning and happy 4th of July. On the count of three, everybody shout out the first food that comes to your mind when you think of the 4th of July. You ready? One, two, three. I don't know what that was, but I hope it was watermelon. That's my favorite. Watermelon. Any watermeloners in the house? Yes, watermelon. Well, hey, that actually may have backfired because now we're all just going to be hungry, right, the whole time. Lunch is coming. Well, um, here's the deal. We're going to dive in quick this morning, but let me say a few words uh, real fast. If you're new here, be sure to head out to the uh, foyer. It's usually the welcome tent, but because it's a monsoon this weekend, it's out in the foyer to say hey to our welcome team, get a free gift for, uh, for coming, and to say hey to some pretty awesome people. We're glad you're here if you're new around here this morning. Thankful you're here. Well, today, 
is the final sermon in a three-part series called Uniting the States of America. So if you missed the first two weeks, you can watch those on our website. But this series is built around this idea. This idea that we who are in Christ want to be a blessing to our culture. We should be part of the solution. We don't want to be part of the problem, right? Unless you're a troublemaker. Never mind. I'm not going to ask for that. So we want to help. But the question is, how? And so we've been examining that question for a couple weeks now. So in week one, two weeks ago, we talked about the danger of getting too consumed with what? With winning, winning at all costs. Jesus lived in such a way that he would choose to lose. He would choose to serve. That's how we win Ultimately, then last week, week two, we talked about the lie that claims that secularism is a neutral worldview. There is no neutral. We talked about that last week, which leads to today. So today is a way forward, a way forward. So we're going to talk about completing this series with what will probably be the most political sermon I ever preach or ever will preach, all right? So this is your lucky day, right? No, but here's the deal. As I prayed about this, I realized that this would all be incomplete without a word about how we can move forward as a country. If we just end with last week, the idea that there's no neutral, that, that, that that's good to know, but that's incomplete. And so we need um, a way forward because that's not it. And so that's not a plan for the future. So today I want to propose a way forward for us as a country. Not that we have the power to make this happen on our own, but we can pray, can we not? Can we pray? Yes, we can pray for God to do it. So today we're first going to talk about a plan our country should embrace biblically. And then second, we'll talk about what we as Christians can do to help. Should be an exciting day ahead. So if you have a Bible, and I hope you have a Bible this morning, uh, go ahead and open it up to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We'll walk through uh, one paragraph from Matthew chapter 5 in a moment. But let me first start like this. So we are at what looks to be a massive crossroads right now in our country and our culture. Our culture, as well as all of Western civilization, was built on a biblical view of the world. We've built our very civilization and culture upon that foundation a long time ago, the Bible. Not that everyone lived in continuity with the biblical ethic, but even those who didn't live according to the Bible knew they should. That was the day of a few generations ago, right? Even those who didn't live according to the Bible knew they should. Even though their behavior wasn't uniform, their worldview was uniform. However, Over the course of the past, you tell me, how many years now? What, 10 years, 5 years, 20 years, give or take? Over the past few years, it seems that a dark wind has been blowing and eroding that foundation. And we talked last week about what the source of that wind is. We talked about how it's it's not a new religion. It's not even an old religion. It's not Islam, it's not Buddhism, it's not New Age, something like that. It's, any good students from last week, what is it? Secularism. Last week, we talked about secularism. That's what's blowing. And we defined secularism and we examined it last week. And the power of secularism, we said, lies in its claim to be religiously neutral. Neutral. It's a view of the world that brackets out anything that isn't material, anything that isn't matter, anything that's spiritual. All those things are bracketed out in secularism. It's the claim of secularism. It's religiously neutral. And this claim to be neutral sounds very appealing if we're brave enough to admit it, right? I mean, here's the deal. Christians know that you can't force Jesus into someone's heart. You ever tried that? 
you're going to accept Jesus if it's the last thing you do, if my fist, it just doesn't work, right? I mean, Christians know that it doesn't work if the state enforces Christianity. And so sometimes this religiously neutral idea sounds logical and makes sense to us. But here's the problem, and this is big. It's a big problem. There is no neutral. The whole idea, the claim that there is a neutral view of reality, it's false. Secularism, like every point of view, has a side, has a take on reality. And this is the point we made last week, but you need to sort of get this again before we move on to today's point that we're going to make. And so I want to show you one more time, like last week, this idea of how this works, that there's no neutral. All right, there's no neutral. So take divorce laws, for instance, just as an example. This is a perfect example. So many Eastern cultures, Southeast Asia, East Asia, those areas, they place more value on family and tribe than they place on the value of the individual. And so in Eastern cultures, the benefit of the family and the group is more important than the benefit of the individual. And so what does that mean in terms of divorce law? Well, they tend to pass laws that make it hard to divorce because divorce is so difficult on families and children and and everyone involved. On the other hand, other cultures, ours, for instance, uh, tend tend to um, place the value on the individual. The individual's view is more important than the group or the family. Personal happiness is the most important thing, even above anyone else. So what does that mean for divorce laws? Well, they tend to pass laws that make it very easy to get a divorce. And so the point is this, you can see that your view of the world impacts your decisions. The idea that laws are neutral is a fairy tale. That is not true. Nothing is neutral. Every law you can think of when you examine it comes out of an opinion regarding reality. Which puts us in a tough spot, to be honest. What are we to do? Not not as a church, but as a nation. I mean, inside the church, it's simple. We have the book, right? The book. And we follow it. I mean, we're perfectly unified inside the church, right? No issues at all. You should be laughing right now. Um, But here's the thing. What do we do as a nation? A nation composed of all sorts of people. What is the best foundation for our society? That's the question today we're going to start with. I mean, here's the problem. Our nation is largely Christian in population, but it's also largely non-Christian in population. The last study I read said that 22.8% of Americans describe themselves as religiously unaffiliated. The new name they're given is called the religious nuns. Maybe you've heard of the nuns, N-O-N-E, the nuns. They don't have a religion. Um, They're called that. So that's a lot of people, 22%. That's over one out of every five people you see. And then don't forget, there's also a small but steady percentage of Americans who are devoted to a different religion. That study said about 6% of Americans are in this category, Muslims, Jews, Hindu, et cetera. So that's six out of 100 people, small, but not negligible. And so the question is, what are we to do? What are we supposed to um, found our society on? What should our foundation be as a culture? We who claim to be the melting pot of the world, what should our foundation be? Well, I would like to suggest an answer to that question today, a way that we can move forward as we continue to traverse 21st century America. So I want to talk to you about a way forward and then why I think this is the best way forward for us as a society. So are you excited about that? Like, what what, what am I going to say? Lord, what do you have? I, I didn't plan the rest of this out. I'm just waiting for a word from the Lord. No, no, I'm just joking. So here's what I think. A solid, wonderful future for our country can and should be built on. The best foundation, the best foundation for the future of America is a biblical foundation. 
The best way forward for us as a society is to continue to build it on a biblical view of the world. Now, for any skeptics out there who are listening, maybe online or maybe even here in the house, you're probably like, really? Come on! I mean, that's all you're going to say? Go backwards again? I mean, we already tried that. That's in the past now. We need to move forward. Well, before you tune me out, listen to the why. Listen to the why. I'm not simply referring to the past. I'm not simply referring to the America of the 1950s when everything was Christian and perfect. All right, for one thing, things have never been Christian and perfect. Amen? I mean, not even close. You only think that when you look from a distance. If we could only get back to the 50s when our country was on track, you only think that because it was wonderful because you aren't zoomed in enough. If we could only get back to the 80s, which would be tempting, but if we could only get back to the 80s when everything was as it should be, again, you only think that because you aren't zoomed in enough. When you zoom in and look at how things really were in those days, you see that it wasn't anything close to being as it should. In fact, my dad used to tell me, he's watching this morning, Dad, I love this quote you gave me. My dad used to always say, the only thing good about the good old days is that they're gone. That's what he would always tell me. And so I'm not talking about something that was identical to the past. I'm thinking of something a bit different. More on that in a sec. But there are two reasons why I think a biblical view of reality is the best way forward for us as a country. And these are very important. Two compelling reasons why a Bible-based foundation is best for all of us. So two reasons. One will be more compelling to those of us who are in Christ, and the other will be more compelling to everyone at large. But here's the first reason. First is this. The biblical view of reality corresponds with truth. It does. Now, some of us have lived under the reality of the truthfulness of Scripture for so long that we've forgotten how wonderful it is and how perfectly it corresponds to the world around us. Don't let the depth of biblical reality escape you. It's amazing. The Bible literally explains everything. I mean, who can say that? It literally explains everything. It, it, it explains reality. It explains how the earth was made. It explains how we should treat all humans with respect. It explains the concept of work and career. It explains why we have a weekend. It explains why evil exists. It explains why justice and mercy are both important. It explains love. It explains the need for laws. It explains why we're sorted out into different nations around the world, on and on and on. So in short, the Bible is that powerful. It explains everything. It really does. It's strong enough to build a society on. And so one reason I think a biblical view of things is the best foundation for us as a culture is that it tells us the truth. We need the truth. It's not flimsy. It tells us the truth. Now, as powerful as this is, I imagine this won't be very convincing to the millions of unbelievers in our society. Right? I mean, I imagine this won't be very convincing because they don't typically believe the Bible does correspond with truth. However, there's a second reason that this is such a great, powerful foundation for our culture. A second reason. And this next reason is compelling, in my opinion, to everyone. Christian and non-Christian. Bible believer and Bible denier. And so there's a second reason. I recommend a biblical foundation as the best way forward for uniting the states of America. And it's massive. It's so important. It makes Christianity stand out in a totally unique way. And here it is. This is so big. The biblical view of reality includes love for your enemies. Now, friends, that is a game changer. That's a game changer, love for your enemies. 
Now listen to what I'm talking about. There's nothing else like this. There's no other religion. There's no other view of reality that includes this idea. Loving your enemies. Loving those with whom you disagree. Serving those who have a different opinion than you do. And it's here that we'll engage with the scriptures. Let's take a few moments and walk through Matthew chapter 5 to see what it has to say about this. Very powerful. Look at Matthew 5, verse 43. Matthew 5, verse 43. So Jesus says this. He says in Matthew, Matthew 5, 43, Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And so Jesus is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, most famous sermon he preached. And Jesus is like, he, he's like, everyone around you says to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, by the way, there's no place in the Old Testament that says this. So he's not quoting the Old Testament here, okay? Very important. A number of places in the Old Testament tell us to love our neighbor, but nowhere does it say to hate your enemy. And so Jesus is correcting their faulty thinking. Their faulty interpretation of the Old Testament. But he continues on. And people are probably like, wait a minute. Well, Jesus, if, if, if that's not what we're doing here, loving our neighbor, hating our enemy, like what other options do we have? Like what else is there here, right? This sounds like good advice to me, Jesus. What are you, you going to say next? Well, look what he says in verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So here it is. Love your enemies. This had to have blown their minds. This is radical. I mean, they may have, may have thought Jesus was crazy, right? Like blown a, ga a gasket. They're probably thinking, well, if we love our enemies, they'll defeat us. How do you love your enemies? Come on, Jesus. I mean, we're supposed to win against our enemies, not love them. But Jesus told them, to love their enemies. He told them to pray for their enemies. And that one little phrase, that one tiny little phrase has the power to change the world. Again, if you've been around for a while, you've probably read those words from Jesus many times. Don't let familiarity rob you of how profound this is. Christianity is the only system I know of that includes this as a central part of its ethic. This is rich. Let's keep reading. See what he says next. He says in verse 45, he says, So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And God sends his reign on the just and the unjust. So the point is, we should live this way because God lives this way. God our Father does this. Jesus is saying, be like God in this. This is what sons of God do. This is the kindness of God. God is good to everyone, those who love him and those who hate him. Isn't that beautiful? Man, God gives the sunlight to evil people and he gives the sunlight to good people. God makes the rain fall on the just and the rain on the unjust. And Jesus is making the point that since God is this way, we should be too. He says, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And so he adds another reason, another motivation for us to live this way. He says that we as his people should be more loving, more loving than those outside of God. He's like, even the tax collectors, like throw up the tax collectors, like the lowest of the low, the most dishonest of all people, even they love their friends. There's nothing special about that. And then he says, he says this, verse 47, he says, And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? 
Do not even the Gentiles do the same? So there it is again. If you only love those who are your brothers and friends, that doesn't take me working in you, he says. That's the point Jesus is making. Any human can live that way, but I'm calling you to more. I'm calling you to love your enemies. And friends, with those words, Jesus changed the world. To love one's enemies, that has the power to move the needle. That has the power to move the needle, doesn't it? You see how massive, you see how this makes such good sense for the foundation of a society. Are you making those connections yet? I mean, this is the formula for how 330 million people can all survive and live together. That's a pretty big deal, right? But the biblical view of reality includes love for your enemies. And that's special. It's totally unique. No other religion, no other belief system, no other worldview includes that. And if they say they do, they're bluffing. Have you seen that yet? If they say they do, I'm telling you every time, they're bluffing. Maybe, like, maybe that may sound like an overstatement, but I'm telling you it's true. I, I, the latest example is sort of the ultra, uber, uber, sort of far, far, far um, liberal, anti-Christian mindset in our country. For so long, they claim to be on the side of tolerance and free speech. The claim is they're for the people, for free thought, for the free exchange of ideas, the bastion of free thinking, right? And yet the moment you speak up against their ideology, they fight you, you're their enemy, they despise you, they act incredibly intolerant. That's what's in every human heart. All of us on our own act that way. And only Jesus, only Jesus made claims like this in a genuine manner. He said, love your enemies. And then you know what he did? He showed it. He showed us what a life looks like, lived that way. He did love his enemies. You know who they were? You know who they were. Who were his enemies? Us. He loved us. And it changed us, didn't it? If you're changed this morning, it's because he loves you. He told us what to do and then he showed us how to do it. This is what I mean when I say that even an unbeliever should be drawn to this foundation for a society because a foundation that includes love for those you disagree with, love for an enemy, love for someone different from you, that's powerful. That's a foundation that a society can thrive upon. Because Christianity, by its very essence, can't set itself up to be an authoritarian kind of dictator rule. Christianity, by its very essence, contains a love for everyone, a love for friend, a love for foe, a love and respect for those who disagree. And that's why I believe our best path forward as a country is to use the book, the Bible, as our foundation for a new day going forward. And so that's a way Forward. That's a path toward a bright future for the country that all of us love so much. So I want to just challenge you. Spend time praying that God will do that work. Spend time praying that God will do that. So that's the first part of today. And that was fun, wasn't it? Hey, the Bible is our authority going forward, man. That feels good, right? It's like, yeah, the Bible is our hope for a solid future. I told you it was, Right? Man, you're like, I've been telling my neighbor that for years. If he would only listen, tell him, Pastor Jay, you know. Man, that, that, that's fun, right? Well, now, let's talk about a, something a little bit more difficult. You guys are here for something a little more difficult. I mean, you got watermelon coming later. You can handle it, right? <laughs> Corn on the cob. And, okay, I need to stop all that. But here's the thing. Our role in this, it's time for something a little more tough. Here it is. What can we Christians do? Those united with Christ, how can we play a role in making this happen? Can we even do anything about it? Well, yes, you better believe we can. In fact, we have to. We have to. And I gotta tell you, I have something very specific in mind for us to challenge you with this morning. I wanna say it this way. If this whole thing is gonna work, if this whole thing has a prayer, Christians have got to act like 
Jesus. If this idea, if what I'm talking about has any chance to work, we Christians have got to act more like Jesus. We've got to do a better job at loving our enemies. We who are in Christ must love our enemies. In fact, this is bold. Maybe you'll disagree with me on this. That's fine. I could be wrong. You judge. But in fact, I think this is why we lost Christianity the first time. I think this is part of the reason why our culture has wandered away. We've never been good at this. Now, I know I'm talking generality. Some of you are amazing at this. But by and large, we haven't been great at this. This is why we lost the first time. We got so consumed with winning, winning the legal battles, winning the power, and we forgot about loving our enemies. Told you it was going to get a little bit tougher, right? Man, this is tough for me to hear too, Lord. Um, It wasn't so much that the, the, the smaller battles here and there that tanked us. I think it was this. Now, I know how we tend to think. We look back on our country's short history and we pin the blame on things like taking prayer out of schools in 1962, or we pin the blame on the Scopes trial way back in 1925 regarding evolution in schools. Now, let me say, I'm not trying to minimize those things. Those are important. But what I am saying is that those don't move the needle nearly as much as living like Jesus and being his ambassadors by loving our enemies. Loving our enemies. We've gotten so consumed with winning that we sometimes have forgotten about loving our enemies. And that's why I think we lost the first time. And why do I think this? Well, let's think for a moment at how Jesus lived, specifically in this regard. It's going to help us to picture what what we're talking about here. What, What are we even talking about? Well, What's amazing to me about the life of Jesus is the fact that those who were the most lost loved Jesus the most. You ever thought about that? Those people who were the most sinful often loved Jesus the most. What? How did he do that? I mean, how? How did he do it? Now, now how do you get people who are far from God to love you. Well, one way to do it is just to agree with everything they're doing, right? Agree with their sinful choices. That'll get them to love you, right? I mean, just affirm everyone's bad behavior and we'll all be best friends. (laughs) Easy. Well, that's not how Jesus did it. Jesus was different. He didn't do that. He he actually um, held the bar high. He never lowered the bar on behavior and attitudes and how we should live. Think about it. He actually raised the bar on all that, but he did, it, he did it in such a way. He did it in such a way that those who were most lost loved him the most. And so how did he do it? Two words, grace and truth. Two words, grace and truth. Let's all say them, you ready? Grace, grace. a little louder, let's go. Grace and truth. All right, very nice, very nice. So two of the most powerful words in human history, grace and truth. Look at John 1.17. It's where it comes from. John 1.17, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus perfected the balance of grace and truth. So first, truth. He never told people their sin was okay, right? Never did that. Never swept sin under the rug and let us learn from that. We as Christ's ambassadors are the conscience of the nation. We said that in week one. That's part of our calling. We're the salt. We're the light. And salt and light stand out. And some of you have personality. Some of us think in such a way that we're tempted to to do that sometimes. But we must be willing to stand out and be different. We must never compromise truth. And then grace. Jesus truly loved people. He looked into the eyes of a person who had been all over the place sexually, and he showed grace and mercy and love and hope. And that woman in John chapter 8 was changed forever. 
Jesus looked at a tax collector, a cheat, a professional thief. Ever known a professional thief? I'm not sure, but I think I did once. I think he was a professional cheat, thief. I'm not sure. He was pretty slick. But here's the deal. Jesus looked at a guy like that and said, follow me. And for some crazy reason, Matthew did. Or Jesus looked at a woman who had actually welcomed demons into her life through prostitution in a dark, dark life. And Jesus showed her a better way. He offered to replace her darkness with light. And you know who I'm talking about? Mary Magdalene was changed forever. So Jesus was full of truth and Jesus was full of grace. And here's what that means. It means we can be too. It means that we too can be full of grace and truth. So this is not a calling. This whole series has not been a calling to change your opinion on your political issues. That's not the point. What, what the point is this, is to be compassionate. Have the love of Jesus in your life. And how about this one? Tone. We talked about this last week. Tone. When you're full of grace and truth, it changes your tone. All of a sudden, you aren't just trying to prove your point. You're loving people and trying to help. And, and when we live like this, we become the ambassadors of God. And it's a beautiful thing. We become more like Jesus. Heard an incredible story this the other day um, about Chick-fil-A. Anybody love Chick-fil-A? Anybody not love Chick-fil-A? Weirdos, man. I'm telling you that chicken, those two little pickles, Chick-fil-A sauce. All right, yep, yep, Chick-fil-A sauce. Woo! Chick-fil-A, as you know, has a, a beautiful tradition of, of, of Christian principles and, and that kind of thing. We love Chick-fil-A. Um, mainly because of the, of the food, right? And also, yeah, they're Christian. Thank you, God, they're Christian. Woof. I, mean, I, can, I can justify it more, right? But here's the deal. As a result of, 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 their, of their, their, their values, they've experienced their fair share of persecution and ridicule. And so the other day, someone told me of a time they read about when, when the restaurant was experiencing a protest outside of one of their restaurants. I think it was maybe in Kansas or somewhere like that, somewhere in the middle, Midwest. Uh, and what did they do? What did Chick-fil-A do? Outside protesting, you know, signs and everything. This is awesome. They served the protesters free Chick-fil-A sandwiches and bottles of water. Makes me want to be a protester, right? I'm like, I'm in. I mean, man. But in all seriousness, is that not just like Jesus? Man, the person told me that the story they read that the protesters, they just lost all their fire. That's what chicken does for you, right? I mean, they just lost their fire, ended up going home, day over. That's the power, I'm telling you, of holy chicken every time. That's the power. That's the power of loving your enemies. What a way to do life. What a way to do life. And so as we wrap this whole series up, band, you guys can come on up as, as we speak here. You guys can come on. As we wrap this up, let me just ask you this. Are you willing to live like this? Are you willing to let your life be stamped with truth and grace? Are you willing to be known as a man or woman of truth, someone who has conviction, someone who rises and falls on the truth of the Word of God? And... Are you willing to be known as a person of grace, someone who really loves people, someone who really gets it, someone who really wants to help people? Are you willing to live like this? Can you imagine how incredible our country could be if we could learn to love our enemies, if we could learn to serve those who disagree with us? And I want to end by reading you a quote this morning. I showed you this quote last year, but it just felt so appropriate to end with this. This is the power of love. This is the power of what I'm talking about. Check this out. It says, the love for equals is a human thing. A friend for friend, brother for brother. It is to love what is loving and lovely. Result? 
the world smiles. The love for the less fortunate is a beautiful thing. The love for those who suffer, for those who are poor, the sick, the failures, the unlovely. This is compassion and it touches the heart of the world. The love for the more fortunate is a rare thing. To love those who succeed where we fail. To rejoice without envy when those, with those who rejoice. The love of the poor for the rich, of the black man for the white man. The world is always bewildered by its saints. But then, but then, then there is the love for the enemy. Love for the one who does not love you, but mocks, threatens, and inflicts pain. The tortured's love for the torturer. This is God's love. It conquers the world. That's what we're talking about. Nobody I know outside of Christ has a passionate love for their enemies. But Jesus did. Jesus did. Which means he gives us the power to do the same. So would you stand to your feet? Just bow your heads for a few moments. And we're going to pray for God's help with this in just a moment. Because I... I don't know about you, but I have not given up on this wonderful, wonderful place we call home yet. We were doing a family devotion just last night, listened to some a Christian song and evaluating the words, and one lyric stood out. It said, who lied and told you that the darkness won? Who lied and told you that the darkness won? Man, that's powerful. Friends, the darkness has not won. Jesus is still alive. Jesus still wants to use us. We're still God's plan A to bless this wonderful country and home that we live in. So I'm gonna ask you to do something we don't do much. I'm gonna ask you right now, if, if you have a burden for this wonderful place. And if you wanna be part of what God's doing, I just wanna ask you to come to the front right now. I stand right up here in the front and we're gonna just pray as a church as we end this series. You can start walking on down now if you have a burden and you wanna pray, God, use me to be part of the solution. We're moving on next week. We're gonna go to the book of Psalms, totally different. But this is our moment. This is our moment right now to say, God, we want to help. We want to be part of the solution. We do not want to be part of the problem. We want to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. And we're going to pray. And then when I'm finished praying, you can, you can either stand up here and sing as we close this thing out with a song, or you can go back to your seats, either one. But I want to pray on behalf of our entire body, that God would make us useful in this place. Father, Lord, there are about 500 of us. Lord, that's not many in a country of 330 million, but God, there are about five, 600 of us or so that want to make a difference. God, we want, we want to be part of restoring the peace and the joy the purpose of Jesus Christ in this place. So God, would you use us to make a difference, God? Would you use us to make a difference? God, as we go and we work, as we go in our neighborhoods, as we go shopping, as we go on vacation, as we go and we live and we breathe, God, every breath of our lives, would you use us to bring glory to your name? Never glory to our name, but Jesus, glory to your name, God. Would you start a, a new revival? in this place. And God, we would love it if you would use us. 
And God, for any, of, uh, any among us who are not yet in you, who are not Christians, who are not born again, who are not part of the family of God, right now, God, right now, would you bring salvation to every heart? God, would you move in such a way that people would cry out in this moment online, in this house, right now, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. I wanna be part of the family of God. I wanna be part of the army of God, the army of love that makes a difference. And so we love you, Lord. Hear our praises as we sing in Jesus' beautiful name. And everybody shout it out loud. Let's all say it. Amen. Let's all sing together.
Amen, church. Hallelujah. Well, there's no PM service today. We hope that you enjoy the cookouts and hopefully the weather will cooperate before whatever's happening in the next few days. But uh, if you're new to Trinity, we want to invite you out to the foyer actually today, out to the foyer, meet with one of our welcome team. We have a special gift for you. We would love for you to connect with our church family. We would love to connect with you this morning. But also don't forget to put your tithes and offerings in the offering boxes on your way out. And if you need further spiritual assistance, there'll be a pastor down front. We would love to be able to pray with you, meet with you, connect with you today on an individual basis. Happy 4th of July. You are dismissed. Have a great day.